All right, so in this video, we are going to cover the second part of detecting outliers in dashboard using validation rule notifications. The way that we're going to do this is by building predictors and then tying those predictors to our validation rule notifications. But in this video, we're just going to go over how to configure the predictors. Before we get into the nitty gritty of building predictors, let's just quickly take a look at some examples of the kinds of outliers that we're going to be able to detect with these pred uh, predictors and automatic validation notifications. Here is a very common picture that we see in a lot of countries. We see we have various data elements, sometimes indicators, progressing over a series of months as a line chart. And then we see one month for one of these data values that is significantly higher than all of the others. You see most of them have a fairly linear trend and you see this one peak jutting out right in April, 2018. This is clearly an outlier. This data does not follow the normal trend. This data is so high above the normal accepted value range that you can clearly see illustrated here that it's almost certainly a data quality mistake. Now, these kinds of data quality mistakes can throw off national statistics. So if every month we're expecting about 54,000, in this case, BCG doses, and then in one month you report 170,000 BCG doses, now, of course, that could be from a massive, massive outreach campaign, um, maybe some door-to-door -door vaccination efforts, but by and large, almost always, these are going to be data entry errors, where maybe a person at a, at a health facility or a hospital, maybe they meant to put in 7,000 doses given, and they put in 70,000 doses given on accident. It's a very easy thing to do. You just add a couple of extra zeros as you're putting data in and you go to the next cell and you don't look back at, you know, it, it's, it's very, very common. And so we see a clear example of this here where you see a very common trend across all these, beat, all these various data elements. They're not changing or fluctuating that much month to month, but one month is really jutting out. And if we were to leave this data entry error in place, then, for April, 2018, you would probably see that the BCG dose coverage was well over 100%, maybe 200%. And that would make folks question the quality and the validity of all of the other data. If you have one month that's 200% BCG coverage, can we trust the rest of the data? So the point is that it's very, very important to identify and correct these kinds of data entry errors. And the way that we're going to start showing you how to do today is have DHIS2 do this for you, have DHIS2 automatically detect these kinds of data entry errors, these kind of data quality problems, and send you a notification uh, when it has detected them so that you can correct it immediately. You do not want these kinds of data entry errors to linger in the system for very long. So on this slide, we're going to look at just a couple of other examples of some clear outliers. The chart at the top is looking at BCG doses to measles one doses dropout rate. So that is the proportion of children who are receiving the BCG dose and then not receiving the first measles dose. And we expect this to be zero. We expect them every single BCG dose to be the same value as the measles dose. We expect every person to get both vaccinations. And we can see that in some org units, and these bars here are representing org units, that we have some locations where the children are receiving significantly higher BCG vaccines versus measles vaccines. Now, of course, this is, should not be the case. We should always see that the number of BCG vaccines are the same as the number of measles vaccines. This top chart is showing us the BCG to measles one dose dropout rate. And what we expect to see is that the number of BCG doses given is equal to the number of measles doses given. Here on the top, chart, we have a target line of zero. Again, that's indicative of the BCG vaccines doses given should equal the measles. We should be a one-to-one -one relationship there. 
then we're giving ourselves an acceptable maximum range of 20%. And that means that we are allowing in this particular country scenario, a dropout rate of 20% from BCG vaccine to measles one, meaning that 20% of the children who got the BCG vaccine will not get the measles one dose. And they're saying that that's an acceptable range. Of course, not ideal, but an acceptable range. But you see, we have two bars here. These bars are representing health facilities where we have a 72.1% dropout rate and a 73.4% dropout rate. Now, what does this mean? This means that we have 72.1 and 73.4% of the children who received the BCG vaccine not receiving the measles vaccine. Now, obviously, this is a big problem. This is either a data quality mistake or this is some kind of breakdown in clinical service delivery. We should never see a dropout rate this high. So this is telling this program manager that, hey, we've got problems in these two health facilities in that the majority of children who are receiving the BCG vaccine are then not receiving the measles. And so I need to follow up. Hopefully in this scenario, you find that it's a data quality problem. If it's not a data quality problem, then you have some serious problems with your uh, measles one doses in, this, in these two uh, health facilities. So those are the bars that are going above the acceptable max maximum range. Let's look now though at these few bars that are going below the zero target line. So they're going down, these are negative values. And we see that there are two here that are really quite big. We have one that's negative 74.5 and one that's negative 70 or 271.4. What does this mean? This essentially means that we have more children receiving the measles vaccine than we have receiving the BCG vaccine. Now that is extremely unusual, basically impossible from a clinical perspective. This is almost certainly a data quality issue in these two health facilities where the bar is going lower than the target line. And you see that we actually have three others that health facilities that are reporting that the measles one is higher than the BCG. Now, there is, should be an acceptable range for this too. We appreciate that in many countries, you're reporting on two different cohorts of children between the BCG vaccine and the measles one vaccine. Maybe you have some kind of seasonal birth um, uh, patterns or trends in your country. Um, but a value of negative 74.5 and negative 271.4 should be considered extremely unacceptable, no matter how much um, seasonality you have to your birth rates uh, in your country. It's, it's basically guaranteed that these are data quality problems that someone accidentally put in far too few BCG vaccines or far too many measles one doses. So these are definitely something that needs to be followed up on. And the point of this chart at the top here is showing you that you can see these very, very, very clearly. These bars that are way too high and these bars that are way too low. And you're going to be able, if you're looking at this, if you're a program manager, to immediately follow up on these. They're, they should be as obvious as they, as they possibly can be. Again, examples of outliers, especially that negative 271.4, an extreme outlier. All right, let's take a look at the next chart below this. This next chart below this is looking at new malaria cases under five versus malaria, new malaria cases five and above. The under five are showing up here as the green portion of the stacked uh, column, or excuse me, this is a stacked uh, bar chart. Um, and the blue portion is showing the five and above proportion of the population in the stacked bar chart. And you see that we have set our range for this chart to be up to 100%. So, here we have essentially a clear 
representation of the proportion of total new malaria cases being disaggregated by under five and over five. Now, we expect in most countries that have um, uh, malaria to have about 30% of our new malaria cases to be under five, okay? Uh, that's a very, very common trend that we see around the world where we have endemic malaria. So you see that at the 30% line, that's what we have. We have, an exp we have that, that a, a, a black line going through 30% that says expected range under five minimum. Now we're giving ourselves a little bit of a buffer because it can vary based upon your population distribution in terms of age, but we then give ourselves an acceptable upper range of 35%. And you see again at the 35% line, we have uh, a, a strong black line cutting through that. And it's telling us that between 30 and 35%, we should see that under five population uh, end and the uh, over five population begin. Now, what you see here, if you look through the months, kind of going from top to bottom, as you scan through, you see that in November 2018, our new malaria cases under five are around 65%. You see that, that green at November, 2018, you see that green line going way, 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 way past the acceptable ranges and going far into what in the other months is just the blue, just the over five. And this is another clear indication of an outlier. So in November, 2018, there is a clearly an outlier in your new malaria cases under five someone accidentally put in a value that was way too big. And you can see that it's throwing off our national statistics. It's throwing off our national distribution and disaggregation of our age breakdown of the mal new malaria cases. So if you were to look at this, we would, you would say that somehow in November, 2018, 65% of our malaria cases we're under five population. Now that's just not clinically possible. Um, unless I just, I can't even imagine a scenario in which that's clinically possible. So that means that you have an outlier, you have a data quality problem in November, 2018. And if you look at the values that we have reported for our new under five cases, most months they're ranging between they're they're ranging between um, yeah about a uh, hundred thousand maybe a hundred and fifty thousand something like that. Um, but here in November 2018, we're up above nearly we're nearly three hundred thousand cases, um, whereas our over five is still in the acceptable average that we're seeing. Um, and of course you have to appreciate that malaria is seasonal. So, so it's going to, what we're not seeing here is the uh, seasonal curve, um, but we're, we're still seeing that the proportion is way out of whack. It's just not possible. So again, another clear indication of a outlier. The point of these two charts really is to show that we can see outliers in a lot of different ways, right? Um, in the first chart, we saw that we can see an outlier stick up in a kind of month-to-month -month trend. Here in the, on the, the first chart here, we're able to see that outliers being illustrated by a relationship between two different data elements. So uh, for example, here, a BCG to measles one dose dropout rate. So we're comparing these two data elements together to see outliers in one or the other. And then on this malaria example on this bottom chart, we're seeing outliers represented by disaggregations of our clinical data by age. You maybe also can do this by gender. And so 
these are just to show you that we can find outliers in a lot of ways, but this requires you to look at the dashboards, to look at your charts, to have these that you're routinely looking at them. Of course, people are not always routinely looking at their DHIS2 dashboards. And so the most effective way to make sure that people address these kinds of outliers that are throwing off national statistics is to configure DHIS2 to be able to automatically detect it and to send a notification to the user who can correct it. Okay, so let's take, just before we get into the crazy predictor stuff, let's just do a quick overview of how do we identify these outliers on a standard dashboard and isolate the actual outlier itself. Well, we have some steps for this and I'm gonna show these to you just um, in a second. The first step is that we want to isolate the period. Um, the usually we just wanna drill into one month. Then we want to change the chart type to a bar chart then we need to isolate the data element. Then we need to isolate the facility level to see where the data is coming from. And then we change the layout so that org units is in category, periods in filter, and data is in series. Now, I just did that really fast. Let me just show it to you in real life here. So I'm going to go to the, um, the demo site for the academies. Here we are. I'm going to log in as demo and then district one hashtag. Yeah. Okay. So here we have a similar chart to what I just showed you. Um, and I think even Bob mentioned this in the videos. Where is the outlier here? Well, there's probably two outliers. This point here, back May 2019, ANC first visits, and this one here, ANC first visits um, uh, from January 2020. Now, how do we figure out where this data is coming from? Where's the facility that's causing this outlier, right? Now we need to do a quick recap of how to use the data visualizer app. So what I'm gonna do is just show you the whole process here. I am going to, I can't explore this on the dashboard. So I'm going to click the uh, open in visualizer app button. And that's gonna take me into the data visualizer application. So now we're in the application and we can start to drill into this data. What was my first step? My first step was to isolate the periods. So we know that the outliers in January, 2020, I am going to go to my period selection. I'm going to deselect all these periods. You see, we have 13 months here selected. I'm gonna deselect these. I'm gonna to go to fixed periods and I'm gonna say January, 2020. Turn that one on. And here we go, just some dots because you know we have a trend line but we don't have a trend if it's just one period here's still my outlier way up here uh, then we need to change the chart type to a bar chart so i'm going to go over here to the chart types change it to a column you could also change it to bar i'm going to choose column and there we go so now we actually see all the data next to each other and still here's our outlier all right now we want to isolate that data element the data element that has the outliers a and c first visits so i'm going to come to data and i'm going to turn off everything that's not a and c first visits click update boom now we just got one big bar that's fine now let's figure out where this data is actually coming from now the easiest way to do that is to go into our organizational units and you see right now I have user organization, the relative user organization units uh, tick box selected. I'm going to untick that. I'm going to select national level or the national, and then I'm going to select my level and I'm going to go ahead and go all the way down to facility level. Okay. So that's going to show me all of the facilities. Click update. Nothing changed. Why did nothing change? Because my layout is not correct. So the last step is to change the layout. We are going to move organizational units to category. We are going to move period to filter, which automatically went for us when we switched out with the uh, org units. And we're going to leave um, data in series. Click update. Boom. Where is that outlier? Well, it is clear. This is right here. Outlier is at facility 147, and in one month, they reported 35,888 ANC first visits. Okay, this is how you isolate for the outliers going from a dashboard. 
uh, in through the data visualizer. A few steps here, right? Um, you also have to know how to use the data visual visualizer. Now, wouldn't it be nice if this notification was just sent directly to my email? How do we do that? Well, that's, that's what we're gonna uh, uh, talk about now. How do we see this outlier sent directly to my email? Uh, I know I just went through that quite quickly. If you want to um, uh, revisit how I just gone through and use the applications and the dashboards to identify this outlier, please go back and, and rewatch this, this presentation and, and you're certainly welcome to slow it down if necessary. All right, and again, uh, I showed this example just before the break, but Rwanda has uh, at least configured some to do this uh, at least partially to um, uh, automatically detect the outliers and send them and push them to people's to emails. All right, so the way that we actually calculate the outlier threshold, and again, we have to compare the data that is entered against an outlier threshold. The way that we actually calculate that outlier threshold is using predictors. And we put that predicted value into a validation rule. Um, predictors, um, uh, Right, um, so predictors have typically only been used for data elements in DHIS 2.28 to 2.34. Starting in 2.35, we can actually start to do some of this analysis not using predictors, but using uh, indicators. So the release that we actually just put out yesterday, you can start to use this in standard indicators, but most of you, basically all of you, because we released it yesterday, are not using 2.35 yet. I'm gonna show you how to do it in uh, 228 to 2.34. Uh, so let's take a look at some of these um, predictors. Let's take a look at some example predictors. Um, what are these calculations for? So predictors really use previously reported values. They use previously reported values to calculate a new value, all right? That's really what predictors are for. Um, and we can, a couple of examples of this. So the first example, I want to get the average malaria incidence over the last six months, right? You can't use a standard indicator for that. Uh, you cannot use, um, the only thing that you can use to calculate that value in DHIS2 is a predictor. Um, another example, I want to calculate the average ART consumption over the last three months. Maybe you're using DHIS2 for some kind of supply chain monitoring. And using predictors, you would be able to calculate, say, average consumption. Uh, next point, I want to see the average ANC visits with three standard deviations. Remember, we talked about what standard deviations were yesterday. Uh, for the last 12 months, this would produce an ANC1 outlier threshold. This is really the actual what we're going to be building now. We want to see um, what is the outlier threshold. And the way we calculate that is we want three standard deviations from the average over the last 12 months. Predictors can also be used, the, 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 the next bullet point, the fourth bullet point here, predictors can also be used to count the number of facilities that report some value. This is a very, very highly requested um, indicator in DHIS2. And uh, even though we're not, it's not related to data quality necessarily, I just want to make the point clear that using predictors, you can count the number of uh, org units that did something. So like, I want to know every org unit that recorded more than five malaria cases, or how many org units recorded more than five malaria cases. Well, you can actually get that number using predictors from aggregate data. One, a uh, couple of words of warning here. Predictors have to be scheduled jobs, just like we talked about scheduling jobs and validation rules. Predictors have to be scheduled jobs. Um, predictors do also require quite a lot of processing on your, on your uh, CPU, on your servers. So if you have a lot of that predictors running, um, uh, quite often you can really tax your server, just like we talked about with validation rules. So you have to be very careful about how many predictors you have run, when they run, and how much data they actually generate. 
because these could all have server server uh, implicate implif yeah they could all affect your server excuse me if you are a server expert or a server administrator out there um, please feel free to talk to us about exactly how you should be considering how many predictors to run when to run them uh, how much data to store um, because because it, it, you know if you just set these up without considering how your server is performing you could really set yourself up for disaster. So how do we make a predictor? Well, predictors are actually, the value that's generated through a predictor is actually stored as a data element in DHIS2. And the reason that this is good or uh, is useful is that that data element can then be used in indicators. It can be used in uh, validation rules. It can be used in anywhere that you use a data element. So again, predictors are very different than standard indicators. Indicator, standard indicators calculate values on the fly. They do not store those values. They just, every time you turn on an indicator, that value is calculated, right? Predictors actually calculate the value and then store that value as a data element so that you can go back and use it in other places. Um, so how do we do this? We first make a data element, then we make the predictor and we assign that predictor to store that value that it generates in the data element. Then just like with indicators and data elements, we have to put the predictor in a predictor group. Then we schedule the predictor group to run just like we did with the validation rules. And then finally, we can put that predictor into a validation rule to allow us to get those outlier detection going. So how do we make the outlier threshold? Well. Um, the first step is that you have to make your um, data element. And so I'm going to quickly cover how to make data elements. This is not a DHIS2 configuration course um, specifically, but um, you have to make the data element first. And this is the screen to make a data element. Again, you go to your maintenance app, you click data elements, you click the plus button, and then you're into making a data element. You have to give your data element a name, of course. You also have to give it a short name. Typically, the short name is the same as the long name. In this case, we're saying ANC1 outlier threshold hyphen your name. And again, you're putting your hyphen your name in case you're doing this right now, you're following along, you're able to recognize your outlier um, uh, threshold from any of anyone else who's making theirs right now. Your domain type will be set to aggregate, your value type set to number, and your aggregation type set to sum. Then we need to go in and make the predictor. So again, we go to maintenance app. We go to, we scroll all the way down to the bottom of the maintenance app. You'll see the predictors there. You'll click on the predictor and you can click that blue plus button again and you'll go into making the predictor. The screen you see here is actually how is the screen you, you would build the predictor in. Again, first step as always, give it a name. Second step is, to, uh, of course, you can also give it a short name and a code and a description as well. But this, the second uh, compulsory step is to define the output. So we just made a data element. We need to go in and find that data element we just made and assign that data element to this predictor. And just to repeat myself, the predictor will store the value that is generated in that data element. Okay. Uh, we also have to define a period type. So how, at what frequency will, or not, so the frequency which the predictor will run, but like how will the, the, that aggregated value in that data element be stored? And we're gonna say monthly here. Uh, and then the next step, which is absolutely required, but it does not have an asterisk next to it. And so please hear me, you have to select an organizational unit group level, or sorry, organizational unit level. You have to select an organizational unit level for predictors. So here, the typical rule of thumb is select the level at which the data is captured against, against the values that will be used to calculate your predictor, select that same level. So in this case, ANC data is coming in at facility level. So I want my predictor, I want the value that is generated to also be stored at facility level. So I'm selecting facility here, okay? So please, you have to select an organizational unit level. If you don't, the predictor will not work. 
The next step is to define your generator. Okay. In the generator, this is where you actually put in the calculation for the predictor. Um, and in the generator, you first have to define a missing value strategy. This is the same as the validation rules. Um, and it will just say, if the values that are missing, or, you know, how do I handle the values that are missing in the calculation that you're providing? Um, uh, the default is skip any values if it's missing. Um, and the question is, is this uh, usually good? And um, typically with predictors, it's not useful. We actually want the calculation even if there are some values missing. Um, and the reason is for that because we still want to calculate uh, this value. This value is actually referencing previously reported data. So even if, you know, in this case, we're actually going to be looking at 12 previous months of data. So if we leave it to skip if all values are missing or skip if any values are missing, then if, if it's skip if any values are missing, then if there's one month of where there is no data, then we won't actually generate our predictor. And that's not what we want. We actually want them to generate the predicted value for the average over the last 12 months, even if there is one of those months that doesn't have a value. Okay. Again, I think this is something that's easier to show you than to, um, uh, to talk about on a slide. So I am going to go into my maintenance app. I'm going to scroll all the way down to predictors. I'm going to go into my generator. All right. And remember, we're making a predictor that is going to produce an outlier threshold for A and C1. So again, what is how do we calculate an outlier threshold? Well, the outlier threshold is the average um, plus three standard deviations of the, of the value. So how do we do that? Well, um, in predictors, we are allowed to type in various mathematical operators. Uh, if you're curious on what all of these operators are, I think I have a slide on it, but you can also just Google DHIS2 predictors and there is a clear documentation on all the various ones. But um, the for the one that we're going to use right now is uh, AVG. And then that's average. And then we're going to find A and C1. And I'm just going to say A and C1 visits. Close my, sorry, close my brackets. And you see my translator is already working. So I'm taking the average of A and C1 plus I'm going to do another open bracket three times the standard deviation. And standard deviation is typed S T D D E V. Another open brackets. I'm going to then add A and C one visits again and two close. Right, so now it's actually translating properly. So we are taking the average plus three standard deviations from the average. Remember yesterday we talked about standard deviations and the bell curve, uh, three standard deviations uh, off the average means that it's going to pick up any value that is 98% different than the average, okay? 98% different than the average over all of the sampled values. All right. Again, I have to give it a, a name for the sake of time. I'm just going to copy and paste that in there. Submit. OK, here it is again. I'm back into my PowerPoint. So the formula for standard deviations is average plus the, plus the data element. Uh, plus three standard deviations, three times STD, DEV, and then A and C1 again. Uh, you might be wondering if this is case sensitive. Um, in older versions of DHIS2, 
it is case sensitive. In newer versions, it is not. So if you're using DHIS 2. Point, I believe 3.1 or older, and you're using predictors, you need to put these in all capital letters. If you're using 31 or newer, so 31, 32, 33, or 34, you can put these in uh, lowercase letters like you see here. Yeah, so here are the other functions for predictors. You can see that there's quite a lot like average count, max, median, min, standard deviation, sum. Uh, these can be used in different situations. The next step is that we have to define our counts. Sorry for the spelling mistake here on count, but uh, we have to define our counts. Now, again, in this particular situation, looking at producing an outlier threshold, we want to reference the last 12 months of data. So we are gonna say 12 sequential sample counts here. A sequential sample count is just what was the last period and how many of those periods do you wanna count? So we're going to say our last period was months. We've already defined that elsewhere in the predictor. We're going to say 12. We want to look at the last 12 months of data. Our annual sample count, which is saying how many previous years do you want to reference, we're going to leave that one to zero. Uh, and then we have a sequential skip count. Sequential skip count will allow you to say, I want to skip some number of previous samples. Um, in this case, we're not adding a sequential, we don't need a sequential skip count, so we're not gonna even add it in. So what does this actually look like? Let's pretend that we are in um, March right now, okay? Let's pretend that we are in March. And if we say a, and the numbers that you see listed here, these are months of the year. So January through December, and then one, two, three, four, January, February, March, April. Okay, so, so let's say that we are in April and we say we have a sequential sample count of 12. What will that do? Well, that will take the previous 12 months. So that would take from March to April um, of last year. Annual skip count is, annual sample count is zero. So we're just looking at just those last 12 months and our skip count is zero. So we're not skipping any values in the last 12 months. Um, this can become more complex, of course, right? So for seasonal data, you typically have to have some combination of annual sample count and sequential sample count to be able to factor in the epi curve of, of malaria, that, that bell curve that you have of seasonal malaria or any kind of seasonal disease. Um, I won't go into it now for the sake of time, but there is clear documentation on our, um, on our website, um, in our user manual, on how to build out predictors using combinations of sequential sample counts and annual sample counts um, uh, to factor in more seasonal data. So we, that is how you make the, um, the outlier, or sorry, the, uh, the predictor that generates the outlier threshold, how do we then put that into our validation rules? Again, we want to have a validation rule that checks the ANC1 value against the ANC outlier threshold and say, if that ANC1 value is higher than that outlier threshold, send me an alert, send me a notification. Let me know that this value is 99% uh, different than the average. Well, it's the exact same process that we just went through in building validation rules. Here, um, you can see building out the validation rule. We have our, we give it a name, we can give it a description, again, an instruction. You can define the importance. Our monthly type again, or sorry, excuse me, our period type again is monthly. Our left side expression is ANC1 visits. Our operator is less than, and our right side operator or expression will be uh, ANC1 threshold. So again, validation rules need to be defined based on what we know to be true. And in this case, we can interpret that to be ANC1 visits should be less than ANC1 outlier threshold. And again, that threshold value is a data element that is coming from a predictor. So what happens when we run this validation rule? Um, we can see that we received a lot of validation uh, notifications. Um, and just looking at this one example here, we can, um, 
see that we have a value for facility 583 in October 2019 that was reported a, a ANC1 value of 126 but our outlier threshold is 117.9. So it's saying, hey, look, 126 is bigger than 117.9. It should be less than, here's an alert, okay? Before I cut over to um, revisiting some of the scheduling, I do wanna quickly show you how you use predictors to count org units. Um, and in this case, I'm saying I'm counting the number of org units that have a stock out of some commodity. This is just this is not related to data quality. It's just highly requested um, thing to know. Uh, and so in predictors, we can also put an if statements in our generators. And that if statement here, if you look at the, the translator where it says valid at the bottom of the of the of the uh, screenshot, just directly above that, you have the translation. And this saying, if the stock out of RDT's um, number of days is greater than zero, count a one. If not, record a zero. So what is that actually do, gonna do? That's gonna say that if you have more than one, or you have one or more days of stock out of RDT's that's recorded in your monthly reporting form, then it's going to count a one value and that one will be saved as a data element against that facility. And you can use that value to then aggregate up the hierarchy and say, how many facilities did I have a stock out of RDTs last month? Or you can even say, put that value onto a map and you can make a map showing specifically, these are the facilities that had a stock out last month. That's how predictors can be uh, used to count health facilities. Again, it's it's a little bit more of an advanced concept. If you have questions, please send those on Slack and, and we'll be happy to come back to them. Uh, for the sake of time here, we don't have time to go into more advanced um, uh, functionalities with predictors, but there is a lot that you can do with them. And hopefully you appreciate that. All right. So one additional point that I need to make is that predictors also have to be scheduled in the scheduler app, okay? So a, it's a different job than the, jo than the maintenance job that we use to make validation, to schedule validation rules. So we have our ANC outlier threshold and we are going to make the job type predictor. Again, you select the frequency that you, that you want um, again, just like we did the validation rules, exact same, you can select a predefined frequency and you can put in your own frequency through a cron expression, or you can say continuous execution. Again, I highly recommend that you do not use continuous execution unless you're in a, in a, in a, a, a disease surveillance scenario and you're only using one or maybe two validation rules. Uh, the job type will be predictor. This is again, different. The job type for the, for, um, to, for the validation rule was a uh, monitoring job type. This is a predictor job type, but the parameters are the same. So we have, we have to define our relative start and our relative end. Um, again, rule of thumb, relative start negative 60, maybe negative 30. You just wanna cover a few previous months, right? Uh, relative end to being just one, which is tomorrow. And then we have to give our predictors into our scheduler. So you just type out the predictors here, they will, you'll be able to select them and then you add the job. Now let's say that you are, um, you have some predictor jobs, then you have your analytics tables and your validation rule alerts. Um, if you're a system administrator, I'm talking to you right now. If you're not a DHIS2 techie, you're probably not gonna appreciate a lot of this. But the point that be made is that you have to schedule these jobs to run concurrently. You cannot schedule these jobs to run at the same time and they need to run in a specific order, okay? For you to actually be able to generate your validation rule alerts. So the first thing is that you schedule the predictor's jobs to run first. Okay, and you again, you want to have all of these jobs run when the server usage is low, when there's not a lot of people on the database. The predictor jobs, for example, you see the example here on the right side of the screen, could run at say 11 o'clock, 23, 
on a Sunday. Very few people are going to be looking at DHIS2 at 11 o'clock on a Sunday. Then you have your analytics tables run after that. Again, the analytics tables um, are just the, uh, a function that has to be performed in order to see the data on the dashboards or in the, in the data visualizer on maps, et cetera. Uh, so you want those to probably run right after their predictors. Uh, you can have that run maybe an hour later, run that at midnight on Sunday. Analytics tables, depending on the size of your database, may take a while. Um, so if you uh, give yourself a few extra hours of buffer and say, then you want your validation rule alerts jobs to run at maybe zero, three. So uh, a few hours after your tables, your analytics tables. Uh, and if you run them in this order, that means that your predictors come first. Those predictors are then able to be seen on your dashboards if you want. If you, if you have them there. And then they'll be able to be pushed out in your, um, uh, in your emails. If everything goes properly, then uh, this will all happen when you're asleep. When you wake up in the morning, you'll see an email from DHIS2 saying, hey, look, these are the alerts that were generated um, uh, last night. Okay. There is some question um, already posted in the community uh, practice or on the Slack channel around how do I get email um, or how do I configure DHIS2 to send an email? Well, the reality is that you have to generate an email service from your service provider. Um, DHIS2 does not have a built-in email host. This has to be provided from your service provider. So if you are a Ministry of Health and you are using a telecommunications company in your country, uh, hosting your DHIS2 instance, then or hosting, say, your email service for your ministry, that host, that company, whoever it is, needs to provide an, uh, uh, an email host or an email endpoint for your DHIS2 instance to be able to send emails. Again, not something that University of Oslo can provide you. This has to come from whoever is hosting your email service. Um, many of you are probably using uh, Google as your, uh, as your default email service. So if you have like a Gmail, for example. Um, and um, if you are using Google, then we've given you some of the guidance on how to configure this. Um, but you have to provide a host name, a port number, a username, a password, a username and password, this is for your email service. This is not for your DHIS2. You need to provide a TLS, um, an email sender address, and um, an address to send test emails. Um, again, all of this has to be provided by your email service provider. We, don't we cannot provide this to you. This has to come from whoever's hosting your email service. Um, any telecommunications company that hosts email services should be able to provide this to you. Um, this is, these are fairly basic things, to be honest with you. The example that you see here is if you have your email hosted by, say, Amazon Web Services um, on the left side of the screen. And um, like we do here at, at DHS2, we have our emails hosted by Amazon Web Services. So that would be our host criteria. Of course, you don't have our password, so you can't, uh, you can't use the same thing. Okay, so we have maybe just 10 more minutes for any burning questions. Nora, is there any terrible issues out there or what's, what's the most terrible issue out there? Um, yes, Scott, there were a few questions. Um, I'm just <clears throat> going through them. Um, do you under introduce yourself from the rabbit. Does predictors work in event and tracker too? How does that differ from program indicators? That's a really good question. Yes, you can use event and tracker data in predictors. Um, the difference between um, a program indicator is that that predictor value is actually saved as a data element, right? So you're able to then use that um, that predicted value in other calculations, in validation rule notifications, anywhere that you can use a data element. And that's very unique in that you cannot do that with a program indicator. Uh, there's also different types of calculations that can be done in predictors that it cannot be done 
be uh, uh, done in program indicators. Program um, predictors can also incorporate values across multiple programs. So that could be very useful to you that if you have like a program for A and C, a program for immunization, a program for birth or uh, follow up or something like that, uh, and you want to have a value across all of those different programs, you can use that uh, to, make a, to make a single calculation. You can do that in a predictor. You cannot do that in a program indicator. Any um, other questions? Yes. Um, there was something about can you use data elements across different data sets? Uh, yes, yeah, of course, you can use any combination of data elements that you want to make a predictor. And then for the uh, general QA, um, that the number of, uh, from Fernando, the number of standard deviation to add to the average to set the threshold should vary depending on the value we're tracking, but a good rule of thumb is three. And I think that is what you are, are more or less using. Yeah, he, I think he said it perfectly. I, I would totally agree. I think three is a good rule of thumb. Um, we don't have the intelligence in DHIS2 yet to be a little bit more flexible there. Uh, we would like it to um, help the user define what would be an appropriate number of standard deviations. Um, we are kind of starting to explore how to do that. But right now, I think you're absolutely right. Just set it to three. Uh, three is probably not gonna steer you wrong in most cases. Um, then there's a question just above that from Paul from Cameroon. Can you explain the significance of each term? Um, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. I think that's a cron expression. Um, that could be a cron expression. It could also be that he was referring to the if statement. Um, so I could go in a little bit more into detail on the cron expression. So the, let me just get back, let me go to the scheduler app. Okay, so it looks like some folks have already done this. That's great. Um, so the cron expression, the, um, if I just make a new job, uh, I've got to define my job type. Again, the monitoring job is for validation rules. The predictor is for predictors. So I'm just going to make a validation rules. Um, my cron expression, I have the ones that I can already choose. So um, like every day at midnight. Um, uh, and like say every week. And this would be every week at, um, at 3 a.m. I think it's 3 a.m. So I'm just going to say test add job. Yeah, okay. So that would be the first day at every day, first day of the week at 3 a.m. So let me kind of explain this to you a little bit more clearly. So each one of these values, so we have zero, zero, three, question mark, asterisk, and then M-O-N. Well, hopefully you understand the M-O-N, that's Monday. Um, so each one of these actually represents a unit of time. So we have second, minute, so zero and zero seconds at zero minutes on the third hour. And then we have day and month. Um, so it's the, the day is defined as Monday and the month is, uh, or sorry, we have um, a day and week and then the day of the week month. Uh, so we have this running every Monday. Now, I know that is kind of confusing to folks. Please just Google it. So. If I just Google cron expressions, there are free formatters online for building cron expressions. So for example, um, if I want to say, I want something to run um, every month, then, oh, sorry. I want something to run every day starting on Sunday, then I ge automatically generates a cron expression for me. If I can say I want ev every day on the first day of the month, 
then you see it generates the chronic pressure. So if I copy this, go back to DHIS2. All right, Scott, there was an update about that question from the user. Apparently it's yeah. about prediction, predictor configuration. Uh, we'll oh, OK. Um, well, let me just finish this then. Uh, so I've just copied and pasted the chronic expression for every day, the first day of every month here. So you see that. If I click Save Changes, then you see, you can say, when's my next execution? You can see my next execution is November 1st at midnight. OK, so you see that there. So that's how you can do chronic expressions. Um, the, the actual question was on setting the org unit level for the predictors, is that correct? It's, it was to do, to count facilities um, with dropout drugs. Yeah, so this is not, you know, actually in two weeks, we have an entire academy on supply chain and building predictors for the supply chain. So I recommend that you attend that academy if you really wanna specifically know how to do that. But very quickly here, let me just show you. If I wanna count the number of facilities that have any specific value that's recorded, I go into my generator and I type if, open brackets, and I'm just gonna say acute flaccid paralysis death under five, just for the example. And I wanna say if acute flaccid paralysis deaths are greater than, let's so say five, then record one, if else, record a zero. Now, what does this predictor do? You can see that it is considered valid. This will say, if that health facility that month recorded more than five acute flaccid paralysis deaths, then it will count one. So the way you translate these if statements say, like, if this, then this, if else, then this. So if this is greater than five, count one, if else, count zero. All right. So this is like this is basic, 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 basic computer programming, uh, basic if statements. But here, that's what it's going on. So uh, if if this is greater than five, then count one. If else, count zero. And so what will this do? This will say, oh, this facility had more than five. Record a one value. And that one value, again, is saved as a data element. And that data element can be aggregated up. So you can say, you know, how many uh, across the entire country, how many health facilities that I have more than five acute flaccid paralysis deaths this month? And you'll have a number there because for every single one that does, it's counting a one. Okay. Now, this is a very basic example. You can make these much, much more complex. Um, and you'll actually, if you do come to the Supply Chain Academy in two weeks, you'll see that we've made some that are much more complex than this. But this is a very basic one to be able to count the number of facilities that record any particular value. 